Next on Currents News, a coronavirus vaccine in Russia's hands. Vladimir Putin claims to have it, and U.S. experts are worried that corners are being cut. Locked out, President Trump might shut the borders to American citizens abroad sick with the virus. Plus, this story of resilience. A family-owned business here in Harlem has fought to keep their shop from falling prey to the pandemic, and they've been successful. I'm Emily Druby, and I'll tell you how. And it was no ordinary ordination. Eight new priests for Los Angeles. Then, seething anger in Beirut. Tear gas filling the city's streets as furious residents protest. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. We begin with breaking news. Joe Biden is selecting Kamala Harris to be his running mate. Biden is picking a woman who would make history if elected. The 55-year-old Harris stands to be the nation's first female, first black, and first Asian American vice president. The California senator ran against Biden for the top spot on the ticket and clashed with him over racial issues. Biden, in an email to supporters, said Harris is the best person to help him in going up against Donald Trump and Mike Pence. Tomorrow, we'll talk more about the Biden-Harris ticket. St. John's University's political analyst, Brian Brown, will be here to weigh in on Harris and if she can help Biden win the election. Biden would become the United States' second Catholic president. Russia's Vladimir Putin is boasting his country now has the world's first vaccine to fight COVID-19. American health experts are cautioning that since the medicine didn't undergo normal testing, it could be unsafe. Camila Bernal has the story. More than 20 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide. The U.S. with the highest numbers now surpassing 5.1 million. It's why experts across the country and around the globe continue working on a vaccine. Russia now says it has figured it out, calling it Sputnik V. I know that it works quite effectively. It forms a stable immunity. But the claim of victory comes amid suggestions that Russia may have cut essential corners in its development by not fully completing traditional clinical trial protocol and not releasing any data. The point is not to be first with a vaccine. The point is to have a vaccine that is safe and effective. Meanwhile, Moderna, the first company to begin clinical trials in the U.S., says it continues to move forward with phase three of its testing. And health officials say that completing every phase of clinical trial testing will help determine if a vaccine will truly be effective. Virtually any vaccine can trigger a short-term response. But getting that long-term response, which is what we really need, that is a complete unknown for this Russian vaccine. Experts say based on the timeline of the trials, Moderna and therefore the U.S. will not have a vaccine ready by Election Day, but could have it ready early next year. Camila Bernal, Currents News. Stay with us. Dr. Robert Tabali, an infectious disease specialist with the Catholic Medical Association, will be here. He'll answer questions about the Russian vaccine and whether it's safe to reopen schools in the U.S. That's still ahead in this newscast. President Trump is considering shutting down U.S. borders to American citizens. The move could block anyone exposed to or infected with the coronavirus. Under the proposal reportedly being discussed at the White House, border guards could temporarily bar citizens or legal permanent residents from entering the U.S. from abroad if officials, quote, reasonably believe the person has come in contact with the disease. The pandemic is a big worry for travelers, and it's a crisis for small business owners. A family-run market is trying to stay alive again. The longtime neighborhood staple has already survived gentrification. Now they're taking on the coronavirus. Currents News' Emily Druby has the story from Harlem. There's a menu here. Famous fish market's doors have just opened for the day, but already people are waiting outside the Harlem shop. Customer number one, come get your order. To get their hands on this fried up food. It's a sight the longtime owners feared they wouldn't see again. 
I have seen other businesses fall through this. Michael is the owner Eric's son. The pandemic has crushed thousands of businesses across the country. A new report estimates 41% of black owned businesses shut down more than double the amount of white owned businesses. There you go. Famous fish market was started in 1974 by Eric's aunt. He took over in 1998 and now runs it along with his wife and two children. It has survived a lot, even the gentrification of the neighborhood. But when the pandemic erupted, the family thought this might be it. Honestly, I'm like, yo, we're going to do bad coming back into this. I just know because we never shut down. The most we ever shut down was a day. The black owned business fought hard to survive. We did a, a lot of things to to, to deal with the coronavirus, you know, we had to change our whole system. They changed everything from their hours to the way they take orders, even to the way customers receive their condiments. They struggled to get a loan and were turned out twice before getting the cash, but the hard work paid off. Not only has the 46 year old business survived, it has thrived. When we got back, it was just the amount of love. It was just crazy. The family believes their Christian faith is a big key to their success. There's a higher power and that, you know, our blessings come from there. As long as you do right, you put out the right energy, you know, good things come back in return. And there's also this special family recipe. It's like a, a, a Krabby Patty formula and it's Spongebob. So that's how we, <laughs> that's how we reference it. It's no other taste like it. And that's really what keeps people coming back. But there's another ingredient that makes this place special. Family, something you feel the moment you walk through the door. I couldn't act for a better father. Fried up food, faith, fortitude, and family. That's what you'll find at Famous Fish Market. In Harlem, Emily Druby, Currents News. Homelessness in New York is spiking in the COVID crisis. Now the de Blasio administration is filling some of the city's high priced hotels with people who had been in shelters. About 20% of the hotels in the five boroughs are being used to house the homeless. Estimates are that about 13,000 people are living in them. Most were transferred from shelters to ensure individuals have their own room and space to socially distance. Advocates support the move. Critics complain about the cost. The turmoil in Beirut is showing no signs of letting up. Police fired off tear gas to clear the streets of angry protesters. The city's residents are outraged. The government did nothing to empty a warehouse of high explosives that had been there for years. Most believe those materials set off the massive explosion that leveled much of Beirut and killed more than 160 people. Even the mass resignation of the Lebanese cabinet yesterday has not calmed the uprising in the city. A French warship is on its way to Beirut with aid for the hard hit city. A helicopter carrier with soldiers and supplies is sailing to Lebanon. Food, medicine and engineering equipment are all on board, along with 700 French troops. When France's president Emmanuel Macron visited Beirut Thursday, he vowed the aid would not go to what he called corrupt hands. New York's Cardinal Timothy Dolan is praying for the people of Lebanon and asking for the intercession of the country's beloved Saint Charbel. The Cardinal prayed while standing in front of a shrine to the holy man at Saint Patrick's Cathedral. We ask your guidance, your blessing, your protection, your solace upon the suffering people of Lebanon. That country, so fragile, so tense, even at its best, uh, has just been uh, further fractured by the terrible tragedy of the explosion. Saint Charbel, a 19th century Maronite priest, is known for his miraculous healings for those who visit his tomb. The shrine at St. Patrick's was dedicated in 2017 during a mass attended by the Lebanese Patriarch of the Maronite Church. There are several ways you can help the people of Lebanon. The Catholic Near East Welfare Association at CNEWA.org is where you can make a contribution. You can make a donation at Caritas.org. And monetary gifts through aid to the church in need are being accepted at churchinneed.org. We'll repeat this information at the end of the newscast. And in Brooklyn on Tuesday, August 25th at 7 p.m., Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Cathedral is holding a prayer service and collection. The church is located at 113 Remsen Street in Brooklyn Heights. The pandemic is changing just about everything, including the ordination of new priests. The Archdiocese of Los Angeles took the extraordinary step of welcoming eight men into the priesthood outside the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. Lord, have mercy. 
The socially distanced service was limited to 100 people. The Archdiocese did live stream the ordinations with an estimated 70,000 viewers from watching from around the world. Benedict the 16th is on the road to recovery, according to his personal secretary, Archbishop Georg Ganswein, telling a German newspaper that the retired Pope's illness, a bacterial infection of the skin, is subsiding and his medication has been reduced. Archbishop Ganswein says while Benedict's condition is painful, it is not life-threatening. There's a lot more news headed your way, including this. Back home after months on the front lines in New York City, I'm Jessica Easthope with the story of an ICU nurse and who she's calling the real COVID-19 heroes. Plus, a survey of public school parents in the city shows just how many are sending their kids back to school. We have the results. And how safe is it for students and teachers to be in class again? The doctor weighs in, coming up. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. A nurse who risked it all to come to the Big Apple and help the city get through the worst days of the COVID crisis is now back home in Denver. Her experience in New York giving her a new appreciation of true heroes. Currents News' Jessica Easthope has the story. More than 4,000 nurses from across the country came to New York City to fight coronavirus during the height of the pandemic. Kind of absorbed the whole hospital. Janelle Orban is one of them. It was a no brainer that, like, that's where I needed to be. Um, I was fully trained and um, ready to help. Janelle left Denver, Colorado, thinking she'd be in New York for six weeks. She stayed for three months. What she learned is that medical professionals still don't know enough about the deadly virus. We don't know what we're up against. I, I don't think that anybody really knows a ton about COVID. When Janelle arrived in New York City at the end of March, it was the epicenter of the COVID-19 crisis. She wasted no time resuming her role as a critical care nurse at the hospital where she worked for five years. Every floor of our hospital had transformed into a giant ICU. What struck Janelle wasn't how many nurses came from other areas of the country, but other areas of medicine to do everything they could to save lives. Nurses from pediatrics, from obstetrics, from oncology kind of stepped up into these roles that normally takes a nurse years to master. Now back home in Denver, Janelle says that city has control over the big spike it saw when 122 people died on April 24th. On that day in New York City, 437 people died. Janelle says out of town nurses got most of the credit when it came to fighting the virus in New York City. She says the real heroes are the nurses who were there long before the pandemic. We were almost out of ventilators. The nurses on my old medical ICU unit said they would stay after work and manually bag breaths into patients. These are the true heroes. The gravity of Janelle's time in New York City is still taking its toll and has changed her outlook on nursing. Upon returning, I actually talked to my boss about transitioning back into critical care full time, and I'm actually doing that now. Janelle's experience has taught her that what's certain in the fight against COVID-19 is the unknown. She says she would come back in a heartbeat. Jessica Easthope, Currents News. A big majority of New York City's public school students are going back to class in September. Parents of more than 700,000 kids are saying their children will start the year in the classroom. That's the result of a survey run by City Hall. About a quarter million kids are opting for online learning only. Under Mayor Bill de Blasio's reopening plan, students will be in classrooms one to three days a week and learn online the rest of the time. Meanwhile, there has been a big jump in cases among children. Still, as some public health officials have warned about opening schools in states with COVID-19 hotspots, others want students back in class. For the most part, they do very well. I mean, they, they don't get very sick. They don't catch it easily. They don't get very sick. In terms of the risk to school kids, um, this is lower risk than seasonal influenza. However, medical experts say having youth in crowded hallways and classrooms poses a significant threat. You're waiting for a second fire to erupt. You're pouring fuel on a raging fire. 
More than 800 students in Georgia's Cherokee County are in quarantine due to possible coronavirus exposure. This one week after in-person learning began. We are not out of the woods yet and we cannot take our foot off the gas. I'm asking that all Georgians continue to remain vigilant as we continue this fight. And over the past four weeks, there's been a 90% hike in known COVID-19 cases among U.S. children. That's according to the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association. We think we're going to see an explosion of cases in September that will far surpass what we saw after Memorial Day. And that this is just going to continue to increase and getting higher and higher in terms of numbers. So understandably, many parents are worried about sending their kids back to school. Teachers are also concerned. Should schools reopen? Is it safe? For answers, joining us now is Dr. Robert Tabali, an infectious disease specialist with the Catholic Medical Association. So Dr. Tabali, what's your take on the new report from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association? A 90% hike in cases among children over the past month, you know, what have we learned about the virus when it comes to children since the beginning of this pandemic? What's changed? Well, we, we do understand uh, for certain so far that th this virus is less uh, problematic for children than regular traditional seasonal influenza. Um, it, it is an issue for children. Uh, they seem to maybe uh, be asymptomatic, but they can have fairly high accounts of virus in their in their bodies, uh, but they don't really seem to be very symptomatic with it for the most part. Uh, very small numbers of children can develop significant illness, such as these COVID type toes, which is a blood clotting disorder. Uh, very, very small numbers of children develop the lung issues that we see in adults. Although this virus can be problematic in very, very small numbers of children. For the most part, children deal with it much better than adults do. And simply because they don't exchange a lot of air in and out of their chest, so they, they don't actually broadcast the, the virus out into the, the air nearly as efficiently as an adult with adult-sized lungs coughing or sneezing uh, would do. All right, so in your expert opinion, should schools reopen for in-person learning? Do you think it is safe for children then? Well, there's a domino effect when children can't go to school. Um, uh, there's problems, stresses in the family. Uh, children get depressed. Um, so, you know, there, there has been a silent uh, increase and in, a dramatic increase in suicides in children and young adults. Uh, some states uh, 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 term children up to age 24 uh, when the children are late adolescents or early adults, they seem to have more of a problem with depression and possibly uh, gearing towards suicide. Um, so the, the whole socialization aspect of uh, being in school is very, very helpful for children. Uh, I'm a strong proponent of uh, reopening schools. Uh, you know, what I've seen, I've been working with a number of parochial schools in my area here where I live uh, about uh, retrofitting uh, classrooms to try to decrease the potential uh, for infection. Uh, one thing we can't do is think that just because we're reopening, everything is back to normal. No, it's, it's, there's a, unfortunately, there's a new normal, and that includes, you know, children wearing masks and teachers wearing gloves and negative pressure, if possible, in the classrooms to try to, uh, you know, get any virus that may be in the air uh, externalized to the outside world and not harboring it in the classroom. Uh, you know, the, the children could be at risk, but the people who are more at risk are the teachers mm -hmm. who may have uh, underlying medical conditions such as being overweight, hypertension, diabetes. And um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have an approved therapy to put uh, teachers on to prophylax them. There's a lot of uh, talk that uh, hydroxychloroquine may be effective in that manner. There's a lot of studies out there that are of less scientific caliber that uh, do seem to show that, that there's a value there, but we don't have an approved medicine at this time. Hmm. Last thing, really quickly, what do you think about Russia's vaccine? The president there, Vladimir Putin, said his daughter was one of the first to get it, but I don't think it's gone through extensive trials yet. Is that right? Uh, that's right. And there's a lot of concern that this may hmm. be, a, a, you know, a dangerous thing. And, you know, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, I, you, <laughs> you won't see me recommending that to anybody that I care for. So, okay, very good. Dr. Robert Tavali from the Catholic Medical Association. Always great to chat with you. I uh, have a blessed weekend. Thank you.
More now on the 2020 presidential election. The Republican convention is two weeks away, and yesterday President Trump tweeted that he will accept his party's nomination on Thursday, August 27th, either at the White House or the battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. It's the site of one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, and it's where Abraham Lincoln delivered one of his most famous speeches. The idea is already sparking controversy. Still to come on Currents News, COVID kept them apart on their anniversary, but they still celebrated together. We'll show you how when we come back. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number, 718-517-3122. We'll be right back. Finally tonight, a Colorado couple honoring the day they said I do. The husband and wife couldn't celebrate together physically. That wasn't an option. Still, as Bob Jones reports, their prayers were answered. It's our anniversary. <laughs> it's not how Angel Wharton imagined celebrating her 17th wedding anniversary. It's our anniversary. Can you hear it? Dancing and singing with her children on a hospital lawn and a one-way video chat with her husband, John. Baby, it's worth celebrating. You're here with us. For a month, John has battled the coronavirus on the third floor of Suma, Akron City, in that ICU room with the cross balloons and that nurse in protective gear waving. Thank you, so much. Thank you. I say that this is my our best anniversary yet. From where he started, it didn't look like we'd be celebrating like this at all. And every day, John's family and friends gather outside his window to pray for and talk to him. Every message that I give to him is one step for him to come home. The 42-year-old father learned he had COVID-19 in early July. We don't really know where he got it from, um, how he got it. The diagnosis came just a few days after Angel, a breast cancer survivor, got out of SUMA for a double mastectomy. I've had that conversation with God. I'm like, why me? What did I do? 2020, an incredibly hard year for the couple. I choose to look at God and I choose to look at the progression that he's making every single day. Angel is hopeful John will be moved to a rehab facility this week and possibly come home a few weeks after that. He still has a long road ahead of him, but continues to make great progress. John is mostly breathing on his own now and moving more. Oh my God, that's so awesome. And Angel looks forward to celebrating their next anniversary next to each other. John, I love you so much. I am so proud of you and you are literally my hero. That was Bob Jones reporting. Angel Wharton is hoping they can go on a vacation for their 18th anniversary next year. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Before we go, here again is where you can make a donation to help the people of Lebanon. CNEWA.org, Caritas.org, and ChurchInNeed.org. In Brooklyn on Tuesday, August 25th at 7 p.m., Our Lady of Lebanon Maronite Cathedral is holding a prayer service and collection. The church is located at 113 Remsen Street in Brooklyn Heights. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.